This is a Defocus Media production. What's up, everyone? It's your favorite optometrist, Dr. Daryl Glover. And I'm Dr. Jennifer Lyerly, resident optometry nerd. And welcome to Defocus Media, optometry's number one podcast, where we discuss the hottest topics, latest technology, eyewear, practice management, and more. So sit back, relax, and defocus. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us this evening. We are live with a guy that you guys have probably seen on social media because he's doing a great job getting the word out there about all the great things he's doing with his practice. Dr. Tommy Pinkston, welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. So I want to give a big shout out before we dive in because Dr. Pinkston, you graduated from UAB in 2012 and you are the young alumnus of the year 2020. They must have not had a lot of applicants, I think, is kind of how it probably went. So, yeah, I was lucky enough to be to be selected. And so I'm, I'm super, super proud of uh, being a graduate from UAB. And it was pretty cool to be selected. So that was pretty awesome. Congratulations on that. That's an awesome honor and very deserving. So no need to underplay Thank it. <laughs> Thank you. Well, this is awesome, man. I know we, um, we we communicated on social media. It seems like that's the new network, right? That's the new way of networking. It is, man. It's the media, especially it during the time of COVID, right? And, yeah. um, you know, you and I, we were following each other for a while. And, you know, we started talking on the back channels. And um, your story was just amazing. It was just, you know, it, you're beginning to where you're at now, going from a big city to a small town. Um, it's just, it's, it's normally the opposite way around. So, you know, before we jump di- uh, deep into that story, um, let's just get to learn a little bit more about you. You know, who is Tommy, Dr. Tommy Pinkinson? Um, let's yes. learn about where you're from, um, your family, um, and how you got into this wonderful uh, profession known as optometry. So I, uh, from, I'm from Florida originally, went to undergrad at University of Florida, and, uh, and then went to UAB School of Optometry just because I didn't really want to stay in Florida forever. So um, got a scholarship there and was lucky enough and kind of took it and, uh, and then graduated in 2012 um, from optometry school. And I kind of have a few things that just randomly fell into place. I think I got, I got lucky in my career more so than being good. And so kind of the first turn was, you know, with residency matches here for most, you know, most of our colleagues right now have just found out for that are graduating, found out if they're doing residencies. So in 2012, when I graduated, like two days after matches came out, I had a job fall through and I was kind of ready to roll going back to Florida. And I was super excited. It was going to be awesome. And then it just wasn't going to be a good fit for a number of different reasons. And so I was actually interviewing in Florida at the time. And I called my wife and I was like, hey, this is going to work out. And she's like, well, all right, well, we're going to figure it out. And I have some faith you're going to figure it out before you get back to Birmingham. I was like, all right, yep, let's do this. So I got on the horn and just literally called every single person who would answer the phone that had a residency opening. Lucky for me, that was kind of a weird year. So there wasn't a, a whole huge turnout. Some years you have a crazy amount of turnout and spots are limited. And this year it was lucky. So people were looking for applicants and I ended up phone interviewing and then Wolfson and I in Atlanta, he had one spot and he said, can you be here tomorrow at eight? I said, I'll be there. So I hightailed it up to Atlanta, interviewed and was lucky enough to do a year there in residency uh, for ocular disease and refractive surgery. And that was awesome. I kind of lucked into it. It really helped with disease and everything you hear about with residency. Um, but mainly I thought for me, the biggest thing was learning how to communicate with patients, particularly how to communicate with patients in a very um, setting where they expect a very high standard. So if you pay for LASIK, you know, you want, you want 2020 vision. You don't want 2020 minus you want 2015 is what you want. So that translates, I think for things that we didn't, or I didn't learn in the optometry school. Cause it's like, I got you 2020. We're good. Or 2025 multiples were good. And that's not good enough when I'm paying a couple thousand dollars out of pocket. And so it was very good from that standpoint to just learn how to handle and set expectations and when, when to tell people no, and when you could tell people yes for surgery. And it's just, it's a lot of different, conversations you don't have as an optometry student. So I really enjoyed that and then ended up getting a, a great opportunity. I practiced at a private practice, probably the best private practice in my opinion in the metro Atlanta area for about four-ish years. And then a um, couple things happened in our, my life. I always knew that I wanted to do private practice, but we had uh, our first child in 2014. And then six weeks later, I lost my father. And so 
those two things back to back were just kind of, it was a big, big change in my life. And so I thought, you know, I'm not going to sit here and wait for life to, to tell me when the right time is and uh, let's just go for it. And so my wife and I started trying to figure out what we were going to do. We knew we liked Atlanta and we liked the big city, but it just wasn't for us in terms of raising children and what we had envisioned our family long term. And so at that point, we started to figure out how we were going to move to North Georgia and kind of the North Georgia mountains away from the metro area, but smaller town. And then randomly, my partner, Dr. McBride, who's actually a classmate of mine, called me at the same time that we were starting to try to figure this thing out and said, Hey, you should come to North Carolina. And I was like, I don't know. I don't have a license and it's really hard to get a license. And I don't really want to take another test because I'm four years out at this point. I said, just come up. We'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. Just see if you like it. It's a small town. It's awesome. So we came up, my wife and I visited and we're like, this is, this is awesome. This is just kind of one of those things, you know, there's kind of a sign. And I was like, this is it. Let's do it. So we joined uh, forces in 2016. We had graduated together in 2012. And kind of the funny part is that we had a rotation together at uh, Tuscaloosa VA. So we would um, share a vehicle back and forth instead of, you know, to save on gas. And so during that time, I was talking about my practice in Florida and she was going to move the Northeast. And we were talking about how, how are we going to do things cool and exciting and practice this high level in, in completely different parts of the country. And then now four years later, five years later, we're like, Hey, you remember that? You know, it's it's kind of this weird twist that we would have never thought that that would have been kind of the start of partnership that we partner now. And so, um, yeah, so that's kind of a short version or long version of a short story. I don't know how you want to look at that, but um, that's kind of where I'm at now. I want to pick your brain a little bit about, you know, because you had that opportunity kind of through things falling through to do your residency. And then you go into a private practice, like a larger group setting. Mm -hmm. In that situation, though, where you kind of started feeling antsy, like this isn't what I dreamed of as being my long term plan to be a practice owner. Like, what were some of the things that led you to, to realize, like, this isn't where I'm going to be ending up? Yeah. So I, I really I will say that the opportunity for me was great. It was a great opportunity. And I think it was awesome. It just wasn't what I had to envision. And I kind of felt like, you know, I was kind of just I wanted to do something on my own eventually. And so um, I think that was with my life changes that had happened. And so part of that was just being able to, to figure out, to kind of choose what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it and where I wanted to go, just like any opportunity. And so with that being said, there's a lot more risk, right? With COVID, the flip side of that is with COVID, it was pretty scary for there last year, this time we were, I'll be honest with you, it was really nervous as a practice owner and having, you know, 15 employees trying to figure out what we we're going to do, when we we're going to be able to open up. And so there's definitely a, a yin and a yang to that in terms of, you know, there's there's some good and bad. And so it was one of those things that I'd figured out, you know, I, I at least don't want to look back on my life and, and decide I should have when I was younger because there was just really no good time. And so with that, with those changes, I figured I, I got to do this. I can't just sit here and tell myself it's going to be OK to just to continue with this. It's a great opportunity. It just it just wasn't wasn't for me long term. I know every situation is different, but I thought this, you know, knowing that path that you took kind of similar to a couple of paths, a couple of paths that right. I've taken along the way. And just, um, you know, many people will get out of school, their first job experience, they kind of in the back of their mind think, all right, this is probably going to grow into that practice ownership opportunity. But a few years in is when you start realizing like, that's not actually going to happen. Um, when you talk to other students or other young doctors, how important do you feel like it is and how realistic is it to get a conversation on the front end about ownership? Yeah, I think that's important. And so I had that conversation with with mine and it was it was very clear, like, hey, you know, I want you to be the most successful in terms of um, in terms of professionally and financially and, and that. But there's just there's no there's no we're not going to discuss that at this point. There's just probably not. That's not an avenue. And I was OK with that. So I took that 100 percent knowing. So that was a very clear um, conversation that we had before during our interview process. And so I think that is the best thing, like you're saying, is in terms of if that's something you want to do, you need to have that conversation up front as uncomfortable as I'd be. It's like, hey, where where is this going? And I would get that either in writing or have a specific plan versus just like, we'll talk about it in two years. Well, two years from when? For next year, from 10 years from now. And so, and then things change, right? Life happens. You know, people retire and then financial situations change and maybe I don't want to retire. So I would 
have a specific strategic plan if that is in your your long term goals. And if it's not, some you know you may not want to do all that. You may not want to bite off more than you can chew. You may just say, hey, this is a great opportunity, and I want to take it, and we'll see where things go from there. And so there's nothing wrong with that either. I don't think you have to plan it out for the rest of your career because you know I'm I'm the perfect case in point. None of this would I would have never picked myself in a small town in the mountains of Western North Carolina five years ago, 10 years ago. So I think if you plan too much, you're going to get stress yourself out. So I think take it, take it point by point, but you do need to figure out what you want your end goal to be in some generalistic um, sense. Wow. Dr. Lowe, right now you're doing a lot of, of outreach with students now. When you're talking to them, do they mention like, oh yeah, and we'll get, you know, ownership timeline set in stone on the initial contract or what's the realities of that happening right now? You know, honestly, with, with COVID-19 just taking place and we're still in, in the mix of it, um, a lot of students are really looking for more security. Not saying that they can't have security with ownership, but they want to make sure that, you know, if something happens, that paycheck is coming in. It's that steady paycheck that they have. Um, so I'm, I'm getting kind of mixed emotions, but I am seeing more people leaning towards, let me make sure that I have something secure, not really ownership but joining a big organization that has uh, more on the back end to be able to support them and uh, their dream and to be able to build from there. Um, I, I take it, it is pretty tough to uh, navigate through a private practice during COVID-19 just simply because you don't know what's gonna happen, right? You don't know what the future is going to, uh, 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 what's gonna manifest in the future. And when you look at companies out there that um, are backed by private equity, um, you know, that, 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 that scares folks a little bit more as well in regards to, you know, do I jump into private practice or do I go work for someone else? Uh, you know, I'm curious to know, I know you, you mentioned earlier that um, you love the town that you're in. It's small, it's North Carolina, shout out to North Carolina, you know, Jen and I represent here. Uh, but if you don't mind just kind of painting the picture of, you know, just the town, because yeah. I'd love for students to get an understanding that there are all modes of optometry, all types of different practices, whether it's private, whether it's corporate, whether it's a hospital setting, um, whether it's, you know, um, commercial, whether it's speaking on behalf of a company, whatever it may be. But a lot of people never paint the picture of a small town and practicing optometry. So if you don't mind just really kind of breaking yeah. that down and painting that picture so those that are listening can really learn and educate themselves about the great opportunity that's at their fingertips. So I'm in Waynesville, North Carolina, which I think we have technically about 10,000 people, but it feels a lot bigger than that um, just because we have a lot of people that own part-time homes here and there's a lot of tourism here around the mountains. And uh, But it definitely, I, I joke that it, it kind of feels like Mayberry. Um, you know, I live I live about 15 minutes from the office and my partner jokes that I live in Virginia because it's 15 minutes away and uh, I have to go through two stoplights to get here. So, and you know, it's like, it's forever, but so it's, and I don't lock my doors. Like, I mean, if you know where I live, please don't come to my house, but I don't lock my doors usually <laughs> because it's just like, you're coming to my house, you're asking for, you know, asking for me to jump your car or, or you're coming and you're coming in regardless. So um, it's, it's definitely different than practicing in Metro Atlanta. Um, we are, and we have a, Point downtown, historic downtown. So our practice is situated currently um, in historic downtown, and it's been here since 1955. And so we have patients that that are we're treating their AMD, and they're in their 80s that came here for their first pair of glasses when you know 50 years ago. And so our practice has had myself and my partner, and we have an associate. So we have three of us currently, um, and then there was two other prior doctors before us that started the practice and then took over, and then that's when we kind of took over. And so it's cool because. I can't go anywhere and not see patients. And so that's pretty cool. Some days I'm like, oh, I just want to get my groceries and you know get out of here. But but a lot of times it's great because it's a great way to just be able to serve your community and, and connect. And so there's a lot of, you know, with in a metro area, you can be anonymous, which is, I think, has a, has a great, um, has some advantages. But here it's like, you know, I'll, I'll be at my kid's soccer game and somebody will come up and ask me or I'll be at, you know, an event and say, hey, my grandmother, she's going to stone. So, and she needs help. And do you think you can do that? Do you do that? And so for me, I think one of the biggest things, it's a great avenue and platform for optometry because some of the general public still doesn't know what we do. Like, Hey, I know you only do glasses, but can I ask you about glaucoma? I'm like, well, I, I do glaucoma. I can fix glaucoma. I'm like, Oh, I didn't, I didn't know that. And so it's a great way because I may know them from some other social aspect with their kids or church or whatever it may be. 
And it just allows us to kind of connect. And I think being in private practice, you know, we're some days we'll, we'll get things that walk in that I don't, I'm like, this is, I've never seen this before. And they're going to nowhere else because they've got nowhere else. It's here or the ER or they got to drive 45 minutes to Asheville and they're going to end up in our office. So it keeps us on our toes because we'll get crazy things that walk in and we'll see, you know, we'll see great grandma and then I'll see little Johnny who's four and, and it's just a great way to practice. And so I think it allows you to just practice the full scope pretty much every day. And, uh, and I love it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it for anything. And I think you hit the nail on the head. Being able to practice full scope optometry in a small town is king because like you had mentioned earlier, uh, the nearest ophthalmologist or other doctor may be 45 minutes away. So you are truly the go-to when it comes to being able to help these patients. But you're also the go-to for, you know, any legislators that may be in that area and want to know, learn, learn more about optometry. So, you know, not only are you serving your community uh, to your utmost of what your license allows you to, but you're also serving as an advocate for all this other optometrists in these bigger cities mm -hmm. and having more of an intimate relationship with those legislators there, which can really help us to, you know, continue to expand our scope, but also protect our current rights. I mean, that's a big piece and that's what we need more of because you can really get in their ears and make some noise. Oh, yeah. So I'll tell you a funny story that, so North Carolina, when I first moved here, they're like, hey, there's a, I'll leave the legislator and I'm, there's a legislator who wants you to call. And, uh, and I was like, okay, I'll call. And man, I got no problem with that. So I look at their website and I look at his phone and I call, I pick up the phone. And he's like, hello. And I was like, oh, I thought, I thought it was going to be a secretary or somebody else. It's a small town. Just pick up. Hey, it's so-and-so. And I was like, hey, I wasn't prepared for this. So I just kind of had to riff off the cuff. And, you know, and, and you know, we had a very good conversation because it's a small town and we had some connections and new kind of people. And it was just, it was just, a you know, being in Atlanta or a big area, I wouldn't have got a hold of him, first of all. And it would have been a lot tougher to get that one-on-one -on -one connection. And so it was a lot easier to call him up later and explain optometry and, to just talk about whatever issues we need to talk about in terms of legislatively, but it's just a, it's a different, it's a different lifestyle here in a small town. Um, now that being said, we talk to students and students will say, well, you don't have, I don't, I don't have this. I don't have that. Like I don't have Uber. Like we don't have any of that here. So like if you, if that's your thing, small town's not going to be for you. But I think as you kind of get out from school and you start, maybe start a family or you start to settle down, I think most people realize like it's not so bad, you know, it's got a grocery store and I got some few stoplights. I'm good to go. So I, I love it. Well, two questions. Number one, do you have a Walmart? Oh, we got Walmart, man. We got Walmart. We got Publix. Sorry. A couple years ago, we got Chick-fil-A. That was like the big news. And we got Chick-fil-A. That was huge. You know, I thought about camping out and getting free or Chick-fil-A, but I didn't because I just didn't have the time. But so we have, we have every, I joke. It's not like we're in the middle of nowhere. I joke. We have everything. It's just it's a great place. But when I when I go to like Raleigh or Atlanta, I just I feel like I'm a I'm a kid in one of those movies where I'm just like looking at all the lights now, even though I lived there for four years, you know, I'm just like oh. so Yeah, I'm a I'm a Walmart, Starbucks, Harris Teeter guy. If I have no no Harris Teeter, Nashville's only forty five minutes away, so we're good. I mean, really, if you want to go, you can go. <laughs> <laughs> oh my lord. Oh. Uh, I loved your story about speaking with legislators because definitely in Raleigh, Daryl, if you've ever called a legislator here, you know, you're, you, you just, there's like an intern that's like, can I take a message? He'll go back to you if he feels like he should. And I'm like, okay. Uh, so totally different relationship if you're trying to communicate with legislators here. Um, one of the things I think it's really worth highlighting though, is you did the ocular disease residency Mm -hmm. And then many people think, well, I need to work at a hospital or some sort of big like medical practice if I'm going to do ocular disease and optometrist. Probably the best place as an optometrist for you to do ocular disease is in a small private practice in a rural community. Because if you're under a big hospital set, you know, who's getting all the medical care is the ophthalmologist and you're going to get the, oh, they need their minus two glasses, like kicked back to you. So like, if you really, truly guys are interested in medical optometry career, this is the path to do it. <laughs> oh yeah. I, it's, it's, I've got, you know, we've got colleagues that I did residency with and, and he's at a VA, the guy that I did residency with, and we'll commonly text back and forth about cases and stuff. And, and he said to me multiple times, being like, I don't know what is in the water down there, but you're seeing some crazy stuff. And I'm at the VA and seeing some. So I think small towns will rival any big practice that you can be in because you're you're forced to see it. It's coming in your office, whether you like it or not. And there's no one to refer. I mean, there's people to refer to, but it's not like you can just hand off to the next doc in the, you know, 
in the practice next door because they're going to have to drive 40 minutes. There's going to be insurance issues and transportation issues. So you're going to have to see it or figure it out. And then I, one, one of the things I like the best is I get to then be a part of the healthcare system in our mm-hmm. town. So I get to pick up the phone and talk to the PA and say, listen, Mrs. Jones, her A1C is out of control. Like We've got to figure this out. And she's telling me it's fine, but we know it's both not fine. How get on the same page? And so it's a lot easier to do that in a small town because mm-hmm. I, I know that healthcare professional. You know, we, we go to common things or we, we, we have common connections. And so it's a lot easier to have a, a united team as a healthcare provider even though we're not under, I'm not working in a hospital, I'm not working in a VA, we have no financial connection, but we still have to work together as a team. And I think that's kind of neat compared to a larger city. I, I may not have even met those or pick them out of a lineup uh, of another provider. So it's, it's kind of nice. You know, I'm glad that you, you touched on that. When it comes to being able to really align with all the other healthcare disciplinaries within your, your local area, do you feel like you're seeing patients more, more times a year? Um, especially those that may be diabetic or um, have some type of autoimmune disorders, because it seems like you can have more of an intimate relationship with the primary care physician or a specialist and be able to bring them back more times throughout the year. What does that look like in your practice? You mean like just co-management with yeah, other, other providers? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, when I, my partner and I, we, we've got some, some connections and some um, relationships with other providers, whether that be a lot of, um, PCPs that, that we'll send to and back and forth and pediatricians. And that's usually most of what we're doing. Um, because we're in a small town, a lot of those specialists are 45 minutes or an hour away and they're usually booked out, but we're using those same, you know, handful that I, you know, I can only use. Um, and so it's a lot easier to, like you said, establish this connection. But on the flip side, we'll get a lot of referrals from pediatricians and from primary care for, hey, you're type, your type one diabetic and you, you know, you're newly diagnosed, you need to go get your eyes examined and go here. This is, you know, this is where I go because I've got a personal relationship with that provider, which is, is really nice because we can not only build a relationship, but back to the private practice standpoint, I can build that private practice by, you know, working on each individual relationship, you know, every day. And, and I, like I said, I, I couldn't talk enough about it. I, I just love being able to develop those relationships. Yeah. Well, I want to talk a little bit about the practice um, buying experience because you, your uh, business partner, Dr. McBride, she was in that practice previously and was buying out the previous owners, I guess, as they were retiring. Correct. And then just fortuitously, you got you were looking for a job at the same time and she reached out. And so you made that move to partner up. Do you feel like that there was significant advantages in a small, more rural town in buying out an existing practice versus opening cold or pros and cons in your opinion? That's so I don't know. I don't I don't know how to answer that question because I've only done one way. And so I feel like I'm, my answers are biased and I don't and I've never open cold. So I think that there's a lot of um, there's a lot of things opening cold that can be more challenging. Um, but you get to start out completely on your own, right? Where you can just start out number one. Um, it it kind of, I think it kind of depends on how you want to approach it, right? You can, you can pay for, you know, I can pay a little bit more and buy something out potentially and have a little bit more cash flow up front and have some established where, you know, even if the car runs a little bit rusty, I can work on it or I can try to build it on my own. And so I think it depends on your location and how you want to approach it. Um, so, I don't know if I'm the best person to answer that, to be honest with you. Um, it just happened to work out from us. I will say that I think that I've got a lot of students that ask questions and they'll say, hey, you know, I've got this doctor and they said they're going to retire in 10 years and I'm thinking about buying them out and what does that look like? And and I never hear of docs or, you know, speakers say, go into practice with your colleagues in your same cohort right now. Look around the room. And, and, you know, I would have never I've never heard anybody say that. And I'm not saying do that. What I'm saying is that things like buying somebody out or partnerships, there's always pros and cons to it. And part of, I think, the issue that students are told is that, hey, go find somebody to buy out. Go find somebody to buy. Out. That's the only way to do it. Or you're going to open up. Cold. Those are two ways to do it. But the other way is you could you could go and get a lease and get at least six days a week, split that with a partner and then go up and up cold or go buy, you know, Dr. Joe out. And just tell them, hey, we're going to buy you out. Start out. You, you leave. We're going to buy you out. You go retire. Have a nice day. And we're going to start this thing. I'm just, we're going to start this thing cold. And we can take on a little bit of that risk and kind of hedge our bets because we can kind of take on risk and 
I can have a lease space and I can then also maybe build this practice and kind of let the lease space go as I need to. And I, I think the reason I bring that up is when you're in a partnership, you've got to, you know, it's always like a marriage and it's all this whole thing. We've all heard that, but you have to think about what stage of life you're in. And so my partner and I were at similar stage of life. We both got three kids. We both have similar uh, demands on what we expect of ourselves and what we expect of our practice and what we expect of just how we expect things to run. And that's not always going to be the same if you're at, you know, if I'm 30 years older than you, I may be saying, I got two years. I don't want to do anything crazy. Let's not buy anything nuts. I got two years. I'm going to retire. But if I'm, you know, 25, 30 and I'm hungry, I want to buy all the cool stuff that might not jive a little bit. And so I think there's some things that to look at in terms of buying out versus opening up cold. There are some hybrid models that I don't think are discussed enough where you could make work with the right people. You know, you know, those people in your optometry class very well, you know, you know about them good, bad and ugly. Right. So, you know, them better than you're going to know Dr. Joe, you know, down the street, you just met in an interview and he's, you, you know, and vice versa. And so I think there's some things that we can start to think about, especially as the, the landscape changes in optometry in terms of a business standpoint, because students say, Hey, I, I can't do that. I've got student loans. I want to, I want to start making more money. I want to start a family. I can't go straight up and, and work seven days a week. And so, I think that's valid. You're right. But what about these outside the box ideas? There are other ways that you can potentially do that if you want to do that. I love that, Daryl. I, I know quite a few, Dr. Dr. Burns, um, who I work with being one of those people, but quite a few success stories of people who have a sublease at, with a corporate group, whether it's a Walmart or the, they, they do that a couple of days a week, kind of more heavy on that at first while they cold start and open their own place. And then slowly with time, they transition out of that sublease and they built their own private practice. So they, they were making that bank while the practice was new and not seeing a lot of patients, and then were able to transition everything over. And it can be a very successful path to ownership. Yeah, yeah, there's a few of our colleagues here in the local triangle area that have followed that path. As you mentioned, Dr. Barnes, uh, also Monica and John. Monica and John did it, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I love that you mentioned that as a path, because like you said, it's not something that's ever taught in school, but a lot of people have found it's a successful strategy. Yeah. Well, you know, Tommy, I would love to, to dive deeper into maybe some of the cons of opening a private practice in a small town. We've touched on a lot of the pros and the benefits and all that other jazz. But, you know, when I think, you know, small town, private practice owner, you know, my phone is off ringing off the hook. If there's any issues that's going on, I'm always on call. Yep. I'm the only one around and I got to deal with that nonstop. So if you don't mind just maybe showing, you know, uh, not just the good side, but the ugly side. Of some yeah. Of the as well. That'd be great. Yeah. So, I mean, there's always, there's always two sides of that coin. Right. And so one of the things I think that you're right about is that, you know, you are one of the only games in town or, you know, there's a handful of docs in our area. And so um, my phone can ring it and my partner's phone can ring at any time. And so it could be a kid's birthday. It could be, who knows? And I've got to figure out like, okay, do I need to see you right now? It's Sunday at 8 p.m. Like, what do I want to do? Like, how am I going to do that? And so um, there are a number of different things that we have to be able to be prepared for um, to to just be, be able to 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 deal with that. Um, and then the other thing is, I think one of the biggest challenges with private practice is just staffing, being able to to manage a staff. And so I think with that being said, private practice in a small town makes it harder because you have a smaller pool of people and a lot of people know each other. And so you 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 have this smaller and smaller pool potentially that you're pulling from versus you know if I post an ad for you know front desk or technician and I'm in a big you know multi-million people metro area I got a lot more people that I can I can pull from and so I think that's always a challenge but I think some of those challenges are going to be a lot harder in a small town um, just like some of those things that are fun and exciting maybe a little more fun and exciting in a small town I think practice management can sometimes be a little more difficult, particularly um, on the on the employee management side. Gotcha. Gotcha. And what about when it comes to competition? What does that look like? Being that it's a small town, are you truly the only OD there? Or no, so I joke about that. We've got some some friendly competitors here in town and they're all very good. Um, and so the with with um, competition, I think that's just part of that's just part of any business. And so I, I kind of I kind of welcome it and uh, and try to just use it to do better and kind of up our uh, increase how we're going to treat patients. And so, you know, that's going to always change it, you know, maybe different practices or new practices or whatever it may be. But I kind of 
it's welcome. It's going to, it's going to continue to change. And just like any business is going to change and optometry is going to change. We're going to have new, new things that are going to change and kind of force us to change. And we better, we better accept that whether we like it or not. So um, <laughs> I think that that's just part of it. And I think if that makes you uncomfortable, then, then private practice, you know, you, you may be in private practice, but you may want to consider maybe not ownership in that sense. Cause if that, that can be uncomfortable at certain times. Yeah. yeah. And I guess, you know, the best way to be able to navigate that landscape is really have a hell of a marketing plan. I mean, how do you go about marketing in a small town? I mean, are you using, you know, social media, Instagram, Facebook, um, as far as social media advertising, are you doing, you know, more digital advertising, Google ads, or are you truly just getting out in the, um, in the local community and shaking hands and kissing babies and making it happen? Or is it all the above? I mean, how does that work? Because I'm pretty sure that's what's taking the practice to the next level. So I, I don't think there's a magic kind of one thing. I think it's a c- accumulation of, of things. Um, for us in a small town, it's word of mouth, hands down. And so, you awesome. know, patients that have a good experience are going to then tell their family about a good experience. And in a small town, that's just going to amplify very quickly and spread like wildfire. So if they had a bad experience, that's part of the downfall with the private practices. That, you know, you, you make somebody mad, um, whether it's rightful or not. And, you know, even if you're not in the wrong, you've got to learn how to, to handle that PR. And so that's one of the things that I think back to your other question can be the most difficult because, you know, if Mrs. Jones is mad. Doesn't matter if I'm right or wrong. She's mad and she's going to tell everybody and everybody at church and her hairdresser and I'm going to have to fix that. So um, I, I kind of like those. I kind of like diffusing those situations in kind of a weird sense. Um, but we do a lot of internal marketing in terms of making sure that patients kind of know what we can offer them and making sure that we are here for them. And so we spend a lot of our time on internal marketing. We, As we're growing, we're starting to move forward to some of that ex- external marketing. But um, I'm by no means a marketer. I just kind of, I'm enough to be dangerous. And so it excites me to learn more, but I, I follow some, you know, some, some people like you and I'm like, ah, oh, that's, that's slick. That's good. So <laughs> kind of try to figure out what works and kind of try to use it here in our small town. Um, but I think the advantage of, of us is we, because we can have all those personal connections, I don't have to rely as much on some of those social media, um, some of those social media type of avenues. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you 100 percent, man. You know, word of mouth is king. You know, when when someone can go and, and literally tell someone else how great Dr. Tommy is, I mean, that's going to that's going to trump anything else that's out there. Uh, you know, this has been great, man. You know, you, you really painted the picture of, you know, big town to small town um, to practice in full scope optometry to the pros to the cons. I mean, you really, really painted a picture for all those that may be um, considering jumping into this. Uh, mode of practice and jumping into a smaller town of practicing. There's one last thing that I would really love for you to dive deep in and just your typical day. Um, if you don't mind just starting from, you know, nine yeah. to when you close, I mean, like how long are your exams? How many patients are you seeing a day? Um, are you fitting a lot of contacts? Let's just kind of dig a little deeper into what you typically see on a uh, day-to-day basis. I know you're seeing a lot of pathology and stuff like that. Yeah. What about some of the other things as well? So, I mean, we, with COVID, it's been challenging. So our typical schedule has just been, been blown up. And right now we're in a very small office. So uh, the, we're in this downtown space, which is great, but it's physically, um, it's, it's suffocating us. We, we cannot grow. And so our office is unique in the sense that we have to stagger patients with COVID blocks, which I'm sure everybody's doing, but we have, we've gotten really efficient at moving patients in and out. Um, and so on a typical day, we, we don't necessarily have an, there's kind of scheduling gurus that tell you what to do and who to see and how often um, we've had to back that down substantially. So we're about two thirds of our schedule versus what we were pre COVID. Um, and we have to share, we're about using about four exam lanes. We have to share those between two doctors at any given time, but we'll see I mean, we fit sclerals, we'll do contacts. And so we currently don't have like, Hey, it's contact lens day or a contact lens schedule. We kind of just see it kind of as it comes in. Um, and that works for us, making sure that our staff is very good about scheduling how that, you know, how that fits in our schedule and looking at the schedule and making sure that it's beneficial. But it works for us. And we see, like I said, a little bit of everything. We'll see soft, hard, RGPs, sclerals, um, you know, glasses, run of the mill. And so it's it's all over the place. But kind of, I guess, were you asking more about my just general schedule? Like yeah, or just daily yeah. schedule? 
Yeah, like how does that work? I mean, I know me, I typically see probably around maybe four, four and a half patients an hour and, you know, typically nine to five or 10 to six, yeah. in the five type of schedule. So we work about 8.30 to 5.30-ish, obviously depending on when the last patient works. And we currently see about three patients an hour. That includes any comp or OV, and we'll kind of alternate those um, with a block in there. And so we have a little bit more um, flexibility because of COVID to see some of those patients. Um, and then we'll have about an hour for lunch, um, which will help. And then on Fridays, we work half a day. So the advantage of a private practice, what we can do is, you know, we work four and a half days a week. And currently I see patients about three of those days and my partner will see it the other day and a half or two days. And, uh, and so it, it works out for us based on what we need. We're moving to a new space in about five months. And so we'll be in about almost three times the space. And so that's going to dramatically change our schedule. And our goal is to allow our, our team to take on more responsibility. And so we do a lot of things different. I know it kind of hinted at that, um, but we're very much in the team mentality and how do we can get everybody involved. And so I want, you know, my entire staff, whether it's front desk or techs or optical to do as much as we, we can let them do in terms of their, their comfort level and their training level. And so that's going to allow us to kind of practice more like an ophthalmology clinic in a sense. I'm not saying do refractions, but you know, where I can train techs to do contact lens follow-ups and we can, kind of work together with them and they can have their own schedule. And so we, we're gonna try to do a little bit of a hybrid model here if we can, but I don't, it's not set in stone, but that's kind of one of those things that hopefully comes to fruition, but we will we will see what happens. Yeah, and, I, and I, I was gonna actually jump into growth. I was gonna ask you, how do you grow within a small town, especially if you want to have multiple locations or do you just move to a bigger place? Um, because, you know, there's competition that's there and there's only so many patients that are there. Um, so has that been something that you guys have thought about maybe having multiple locations or just going to, uh, surrounding towns, I guess, to be able to accommodate those patients. I mean, what are your thoughts in regards to that? Right, right now we are, you know, we are, we're focused on opening up this new space because we closed on this space like two weeks before COVID. So that was oh, pretty wow. wild to close on a building and then COVID <laughs> hit. And then we kind of figured this is a little crazy. I don't know what's going to happen. We've got this building that how are we going to build it? And now we've got employees. We didn't know, you know, layoffs. And so that was, that was crazy. And so we put everything on hold just so that we didn't have to you know, make tough decisions because we're in a small town. So I sure as heck didn't want to have to make decisions that were going to affect people's lives and livelihood. And, and that's, you know, those are tough calls that you have to be prepared to make. Right. So we just put everything on hold and uh, kind of repicked up the pieces here in the fall and as a result have started to, to grow that 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 building and, uh, and it's currently in renovations and so where that takes us i don't know i have some some kind of all over the place right now a shotgun approach we'll kind of see see how this new building kind of um, comes to fruition the advantage that we have in a small town and i think this is happening nationally though is uh, we've seen a lot of people move from larger cities to small towns and so i think that will change at least in our area maybe how we um, we practice because we you know the housing market across the country is going up but we live in a great area with beautiful views and people are retiring here and so i don't foresee that our area is going to get any smaller so it'll feel small but i don't think it's going to have the physical presence that of, of a small town as much when you're talking about that presence um i'm curious to know what the presence is in your office when it comes to frame designers because I've interviewed some people in the past that have been in smaller towns and it seems like smaller towns like more funkier frames, you know, things that stand out, more independent eyewear. Are you seeing the same thing in your town or is it more a big box approach? No, we've got some cool stuff. And so I, you know, I know what I do well and picking out frames is not one of them. And so <laughs> our opticians are great at that. And we have some very cool, funky hit frames and they're always coming to me and say, try these on, they look cool. I'm like, I don't know, that's a little outside of my comfort zone. But um, we we definitely try to have a different independent eyewear approach. And so, you know, we definitely have some things that are standard that you're gonna find at, you know, any any um, any optical department, but yeah. um, we try to we try to continue to support independent um, frame lines. And, and with that being said, with this new space, we're going to have a lot more um, ability to do that. And so we, we like to be able to do that. And just to kind of, our downtown is pretty eclectic in, in terms of there's a lot of art and culture down here. And so it fits in very well with just the, 
the culture and the feel of downtown. And it's, it's kind of hard to describe, but if you walk it and you're ever down this area, you'll kind of see that, you know, there's probably 10 art places down here that sell all kinds of different things. And so we, we fit in very well with that type of a style in my opinion. Gotcha. Well, I got to come visit you, man. You're not yeah, too man. far away, right? We're North yeah. Carolina family, so we got to make yeah. it happen sooner than later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome, man. Well, I really appreciate you taking your time to hang out with Jen and I. This yeah, um, I would love for you just to leave some advice for just the eye care world, you know, just um, any advice that you may have to just make this profession better. Um, I love to have our guests just leave something that can really resonate with the hearts of our followers and listeners. So any advice or tips that you have, uh, we would love to, to hear it. That's heavy, man. That's a lot to go out with. Um, <laughs> I would say that my biggest piece of advice, and this is not necessarily I wise and I, t I will, it sounds cheesy, but this is what I tell my kids. We have a saying and it's, we, I tell my kids we do hard things, right? And so, you know, my kids are, my oldest is kind of learning how to swim now and she's close and my youngest or my middle son is, is, uh, is learning how to ride a bike without training wheels. And so, you know, they get nervous and scared. Yeah. I said, what do we do? And I said, we do hard things and they yell it back. And so I think very commonly we all feel uncomfortable with things, whether that's personal or whether it's business. And so don't be afraid to put yourself in uncomfortable situations that I'm included by no means am I this kind of crazy personality. It's going to be like, woo, no risk. No, I get it. I'm very risk averse naturally. And uh, I think it takes kind of cultivating those things and putting yourself in uncomfortable situations so that you're going to grow personally, professionally in a business sense. And, and we all kind of know where we want to go. If the question is, can I make that decision to push myself to be uncomfortable? So I would say go do hard things for optometry or for your business or personally. Uh, and I think you'll, you'll, you won't regret it. I love that, man. And I think that's the only way you could truly grow as a person, because if you don't put yourself in those positions, how are you going to grow and take it to the next level? You're just going to stay stagnant and never see what your full potential is. So I think that's one of the best pieces of advice that we've actually received on this uh, podcast. So thank you so much, Dr. Yeah. Tommy. Uh, we look forward to learning more about you, more about your future. At some point in time, when you get this new practice, we'll love to bring you on for Opto Cribs so we can actually tour the new practice and see all the eyewear and the layout of your uh, new facility. But thank you so much for hanging out with Dr. Jennifer Lyerly and I this evening. We look forward to really uh, growing with you. Um, it seems like you have quite the fan club here. We've been getting some comments <laughs> all night. Uh, looks like Michelle Self wanted to say good job to you. Um, and I just want to say good job to you as well, man. And keep up the great work, all right? If there's anything you need, feel free to holler at Jen and I, and we'll make it happen, all right? Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, anytime, man. It's your favorite optometrist, Dr. Daryl Glover. You guys have a great one. Stay healthy, stay positive, and stay blessed. Until next time, you guys have a great one. Thank you. All right, colleagues, and it's a wrap. Thank you dearly for hanging out with the Defocus Media team. We hope truly something resonated with you. And if it did, be sure to give us five stars and make sure you follow us on all social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, you named it. And our handle is at Defocus Media on all platforms. And until next time, be sure to keep it 2020 and we look forward to seeing you on the next episode.